Morning, Ben. Thanks for sending your slides through. It looks Morning. like you've had a busy period over Christmas and New Year. Yeah, reasonably. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so if you let me know when you want to move the slides on and yep. uh, you can give us a run through what you've been seeing. OK, great. So let's have the first slide. There's two things to say. One's sheep, one's cattle and then one's both. Um, so if we have the first slide. The first thing I thought we would do was go through what I've seen fluke wise in the PM room and how it's gone. And broadly speaking, fluke, when you talk about fluke, you're always talking about the weather, aren't you? And generally speaking, it was a dry early part of the season. Um, and then it turned wet in about September, October, but it was still warm. Um, so I think that gave the snails a wake up and everything's been, for me anyway, pushed a little bit further back in the year. The the, it is a fluke season this year, but it's probably better, uh, later, I should say. Um, so um, there was a cold spell in December, but then it got warm again. So I think the snails were, until this re most recent cold spells, probably about. So there will have been some fluke going into some sheep and cattle. Um, uh, the, generally speaking, the lab said that there were not many seropositives and not much coprovantid until uh, fairly recently, sort of December time, which sort of fits in with what I've seen. So the first case I had, if we go to the next slide, was on the 23rd of November uh, 2023, uh, which was a case of subacute fluke here. And this was in some ewes from County Durham from a known wet farm, which on the back of what they'd heard didn't treat at uh, Tupping and this was the result. So they didn't check, they didn't test, they didn't treat and they got caught out with a subacute fluke here. This was the first liver, you know, typical um, hemorrhagic tracts and uh, biliary fibrosis and all that. This is picture number one and picture number two shows you a closer up version of the actual flukes which look to be getting on for eight to ten weeks old I would think and of course the age of the fluke is essential both for uh, diagnostics to know whether you're if you have treated whether it's worked or not and to know what to um, treat them with as well afterwards so that was case number one and then the next day I think I had case number two on the 24th of November which is a similar state also in County Durham this one um, hemorrhagic tracts uh, all the way through and the next picture shows the actual fluke um oh no i think that's just the liver so this one looks like a bit more of a younger um younger fluke causing this problem because the main picture in this liver was um mainly just um the hemorrhagic tracts and the fibrosis rather than um there being adult fluke so that fella treated as well he went with triclobendazole just based on the guess of the uh, age of the fluke this was case number three on the 27th so as you can see, I had a run in the back of um, November where we thought oh, this is getting going now. And as, as you would expect, as in this picture, the acute fluke comes first with the And there you can see those um, black, tortuous hemorrhagic tracts. That's the immature fluke working their way through the uh, liver substance. And then case the other photo for this. Uh, case I think shows you the actual flukes that were responsible which again are getting on for um, probably eight to ten weeks old uh, obviously all the flukes that you see aren't going to be the same age because they won't all have come in on one day they'll have come in um, over a period of time depending on the um, pasture uh, again this bloke um, uh, hadn't um, tested and hadn't treated um, and then we have case number four um, now we're going into the middle of December, so as you would expect, the fluke are getting a bit bigger um, and the liver starts to look a bit more pale and fibrose rather than um, pate like. But um, here's another case where um, he, this bloke had treated, but he treated too early in this case. He hadn't checked and he, he treated them pre-tupping. Um, but he hadn't done any testing, so he just guessed and probably what had happened was it was infection since the top, since the treatment. So um, he, he just went in too early and didn't go in again. Uh, that was this bloke's problem. Um, case five. Um, now, this was an interesting one because this obviously is getting towards more chronic fluke in this case because the flukes are considerably bigger the liver is considerably more fibrosed this guy had treated with triclobendazole six weeks before 
um, this um, uh, animal died, and this was a tup. Uh, he treated six weeks before, and I would say those flukes are comfortably older than six weeks old, so those fluke very likely will have been present when that treatment with triclobendazole was given, so it's very likely that, that those fluke are resistant to the triclobendazole that was given. Uh, and so what happened was he treated them again, and two weeks later with triclobendazole, you can still see that there's a fluke there. So in that case, triclobendazole resistance is very likely. And so those sheep were all treated with clozantel and they did improve. Um, demonstrating triclobendazole resistance for certain uh, can be a little bit tricky insofar as there are three options. One is um, Trichlo fluke egg count, so fluke egg count reduction test, but obviously you have to then wait till the um, infection is chronic enough for there to be fluke eggs, or coproantigen reduction test, which is more accessible and you can do it earlier on and is virtually validated, I think. Or you can have a dead sheep, uh, you can measure the size of the fluke, and if the age of the fluke is more than the interval since last dosing with triclobendazole, then that's strongly strongly suggestive. So the age of the fluke is important um, to, to figure out um, in these cases. Uh, and then the next, oh, and this is, yes, this is the, uh, this is the second picture again of that, of those tups um, in that case, which with suspect triclobendazole resistance. Um, and this, and there was another case that popped up uh, in, um, in early January, which on another farm, you know, different farms are always at different stages. But here's another case of subacute fluke um, just on a different farm, which um, he needed to treat with Clozantel um, in that case in response. And those, those are the fluke there, the adult flukes. Well, the almost adult flukes getting to think. And again, in this case, he treated with triclobendazole six weeks ago, making it likely that there is a degree of triclobendazole resistance on that farm. Uh, so he had to go in with Clozantel. Um, and then the last case, which demonstrates another aspect of fluke control, which is quarantine dosing. Uh, this top was bought in from a different farm down country. This farm was in uh, North Yorkshire. Um, bought in on the 4th of October. The top started losing condition and going pale. Um, everybody's busy, didn't get around to do anything about it. The tup died and was full of just about chronic fluke. You can see the size of that fluke there in the top right hand corner of that photo. Um, and so the interval, he will have been on the farm three months, three, three and a bit months. So it's difficult, a little bit difficult to say whether had he acquired those fluke um, on the farm or came with them. But the one thing is he was not quarantine drenched uh, for fluke on arrival. Um, and I don't think it was established whether the farm he came off of was a fluky farm. So fluke can live forever. So it's conceivable that he could have acquired it since um, arrival, but he could also have come with it and could have been, this disease could have been prevented had there been a quarantine fluke drench given at the, at the time of arrival. So three things, uh, treat at the right time, treat with a, um, drug which is likely to be effective against the stage of wormer and to which there isn't any resistance. And three, don't forget about quarantine drenching, especially uh, tups when they come in. Those are the lessons so far. And generally speaking, as you can see, the flukes behaved as you would expect it to behave. Uh, acute and subacute cases first, followed by chronic cases like this one. And I would think with some more chronic cases to come yet. And the last thing to say about fluke is that uh, scanning time is an ideal time to do some testing and figure out where you are in the because the sheep are in anyway right yep. last thing is i i think that's the second picture of that tup yeah and then here's a bull uh, don't forget about the cattle cattle can act as a reservoir of she of fluke for sheep probably for next season now and there's a, that was an adult bull that I think actually probably died mostly of the fluke lesions that he had. They're pretty established. You can see that liver does not look very happy. I think the next one's another picture of the same thing. Yeah. There we are. So fluke, interesting as ever. And here is a reminder of the size of fluke, which is critical to know really when determining uh, how long the fluke have been there 
have those fluke been exposed to triclobendazole during their lifetime? And if so, and they're still alive, the chances are there may be some evidence of resistance. Also, what are you going to treat them with now? If they're more than six to eight weeks old, you can use Clostantel. If they're not, then it's triclobendazole. But bear in mind, there may be resistance. Okay. So that's the fluke roundup. I suspect there's more to come next month about fluke. Um, this is a cattle roundup. This is a bloke that um, bought, brought inside some heifers, a group of bunch of heifers to uh, carve down, and he wormed them two weeks after housing with ivermectin. Uh, didn't think too much more about it, but after these heifers had carved down, they presented with condition loss, coughing, and uh, one of them eventually died and was sent in. The bloke suspected IBR, but he didn't respond to any treatment. And here was what I found when I got this cattle on my table. Bacterial bronchopneumonia, fair enough, maybe, you know, a bit of stress. But then when I looked in the uh, trachea, this is what I found. Lots and lots of live adult lungworms, which, as I said, had been treated a month or more earlier on, had been exposed to ivermectin. Uh, and the fact that they were still there strongly suggests that there was some ivermectin resistance in this species of dictyocorus, corpus, which seems to be an emerging problem, becoming a bit more common with uh, increasing use of um, ivermectin porons in cattle. So I just flagged this up as a thing to be aware of in the coming grazing season. Don't assume that there isn't any resistance to um, um, avermectins in longworm. It does seem to be an emerging thing. There is work being done on it at the more done and uh, it's something we should have in the back of our minds, I think, with the uh, grazing season coming. It can be. This is I mean, this is a, a serious. This is not an academic um, interest of little clinical sharp end consequence. This was a bloke that had serious production losses in these heifers because he'd assumed that the drug had worked and it hadn't. Serious stuff, really. Uh, that's that. And then the last thing to flag up is that there have been increasing reports of uh, rising teeters in the back end in bulk milk Spallenberg um, antibody levels and some reports now of um, scanning levels disappointing, uh, suggesting early embryonic loss uh, and some early reports in the south coming through of arthrogryposis for which one of the differentials is congenital Schmallenberg uh, infection. So we could be looking forward to some uh, deformed calves and lambs come springtime um, when these lambs start to be born. And the best thing to do is to uh, submit these to APHA for the free testing, because not all cases of arthrogryposis are caused by Schmallenberg, but, you know, some are. It's a good thing to keep an eye on uh, on um, on what, what it's doing. I think yeah. so. Yeah, free testing is always a good idea, Ben. So yes, yeah. no, nothing, nothing to be. Uh, yes, no one ever turned down a free test, did they? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's great. Thank you very much for that, and good effort with the dogs going bananas in the background <laughs> there. So well done for keeping going. Yeah. Um, that's great. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, we'll look forward to seeing what comes through next month. Um, yes. And uh, uh, wise words as always. Test, don't guess, and, and make sure you're treating the right animals with the right stuff at the right testing. time. Now's the time, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt.